Take it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the organizers for the very nice invitation, uh, in particular, Stefan Müller. Uh, yeah, so today I, I will talk about uh, the research I've, I've been doing since my PhD. And right now I'm postdoc in the same lab. So yeah, I'm still continuing the same line of research. So uh, what I'm presenting is the results I have so far, which um, as you, as you can see, you mentioned, uh, they are also concerned some kind of optimality considerations about uh, how cells function. So first of all, uh, what we talk today is about optimality of cellular resource allocation of this study of the optimality of cellular models and the kind of model that I'll talk about today, uh, uh, nonlinear. So in comparison to the usual linear methods that, that usually uh, are large and can be genome scale. So they model each reaction in cells. Uh, I, I suppose many of you are familiar with flux balance analysis or FBA, which is a linear method that basically considers the mass balance constraints or the mass conservation reactions and look into the maximization of uh, a mass reaction that simulates the production that of everything that the cell needs to produce in order to grow and in these linear methods you can solve everything very easily and you can estimate or predict the behavior of cells uh, but we also have a few, uh, nonlinear methods and nonlinear methods uh, they have advantages advantages and disadvantages so uh, one type of nonlinear methods that uh, try to simulate the whole cell, uh, what they, what's, what's called a self-replicated type of modeling that was introduced by Molina and colleagues in 2009. And in this type of model that what, we, what they proposed is that you have a small model, but it's just a toy model, a, a conceptual model of components of the cell. But instead of a biomass reaction, have a ribosome reaction uh, that takes, uh, that produces the proteins specifically also consider mass balance. And the main difference is that accounts for nonlinear kinetics. And that's mainly the source of all troubles with this kind of model. And so, and also the, the, the density of the model, this is the cell is limited. So here, mathematically, in this type of model, we have some advantages, which is mathematically can maximize growth rate directly and not only estimate through a biomass reaction. So, uh, conceptually, we have here a figure of what Molina proposed was uh, we have a, a cell, we have, they have some substrate outside, and there's some proteins that act as transporters, get the substrate inside, and there you can have a metabolic network. Here, just one reaction, one enzymatic reaction produces a precursor that is used by the ribosome, and the ribosome itself produces all proteins in one, each one of these reactions. Here, they also consider uh, 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 how you need to produce membranes, but we are not concerned that further. Um, they show that with numerical simulations that at least qualitatively they can uh, predict and explain some kind of behaviors of cells, right? So the famous monode kind of relationship, which is not very surprising, but also how uh, different pathways, the, the, the investment in proteins in different reactions change with growth rate. Uh, the limitations with the, this kind of approach is that we need all kinetic parameters and we don't have that and that's a huge limitation in practice but also uh, the way it was proposed uh, it depends it relies on numerical optimization and as i said that's the reason why you are very uh, limited to very small models because this corresponds to a very difficult uh, optimization for large models uh, one of these constraints in particular deserves a little bit of explanation because we talk, as I mentioned, is the source of most of the problems that we have with that is the reaction kinetics. So uh, I, I suppose many of you are familiar with the Michel's meta kinetics, uh, but just some quick summary here. Uh, this type of constraint considered the flux of reactions of each reaction index J here depends of concentration of one protein catalyzing, can be the enz one enzyme or you could say the ribosome is also a protein and some function that is a, the, the rate law that depends on metabolite concentrations. 
for example, the irreversible Michel symmetry, we have this type of equation here. And we can say this, the catalytic frequency and depends on the concentration of substrate in a hyperbolic uh, way as this here. And we can also define the catalytic time in the discussion today, which is will be more convenient, which is just the inverse of the, the catalytic frequency, just uh, the same kind of function, just the inverse. Okay, so uh, recently we extended, or we modified a little bit the approach by Mona uh, in a framework that we call growth balance analysis. Uh, we tends to be a framework for modeling also as, uh, uh, for example, flux balance analysis is for linear models. So we repeat many things that Molina did already. So we consider there's a, there's a cell here with a boundary. There's some external components uh, in red here that are exported to the, to the model, to the cell or out of the cell. We have a metabolic network, a reaction network that converts these uh, compounds. And there's a special reaction, the ribosome reaction that takes components from uh, the reaction network and gives back some of it, for example, uh, it takes a a ATP and gives back ADP. And, but the main property of this, fun this reaction that produces all proteins. So these are represent all proteins that need to be produced in order to catalyze the reactions. So we have the mass and flux balances as in uh, FBA, which for this information uh, is just to guarantee that reactions are conserving mass. So each unit of mass going into one reaction uh, equals to the all mass that's produced by each reaction. And the flux that uh, produce, all flux producing one component, the green uh, circle here, has to be equal to the flux which uh, this compound is consumed by all reactions, but important here also accounted for the dilution by growth. So this error here is represented that we, uh, specifically consider the balanced growth condition, which means that all components need to be produced uh, with a net production rate that's proportional to the concentration and to the growth rate. And then we have the reaction kinetics again, as I mentioned, and something a little bit different from the original type of model, uh, model by Molina is that we not only consider that all protein concentrations are limited, uh, but we, instead we consider that uh, proteins plus all metabolite concentrations are actually fixed. And that's more, uh, that's supported by evidence. And also it brings a very important conceptual link between protein and metabolite concentration as we see next. So we define uh, what we call a GBA model depends on three pieces of information, which is the stoichiometric matrix and uh, the functions uh, I'm calling tau here, which, which is basically just some arbitrary given uh, kinetic rate loss, and rho is the density of the cell, of the components of the cell. So mathematically, uh, this problem is formalized as this here. So we want to estimate the cellular state defined by the all reaction rates and protein concentrations and metabolite concentrations that maximize growth rate. So we have the mass conservation, as I mentioned before, uh, in the right-hand side, as I said, we consider specifically the best growth condition, which means that this is the rate of dilution by growth for each of the components. And that's, that's different from different kinds of modeling approaches. Uh, the reaction kinetics uh, for each reaction. And again, as Molina, we assume that the sum of all proteins is, is, has a value, but different than Molina, uh, we don't assume this is a fixed value because also experiments uh, in bacteria, for example, indicate that this uh, is not actually uh, a fixed value in different growth conditions, but it actually decreases with growth rate. But instead, as I mentioned before, that actually the sum of all protein concentrations plus metabolites is a fixed value. And um, uh, just an observation, here then we need to simplify the formulation and consider that these concentrations are mass uh, concentrations. and use mass units here to make uh, equations simpler. So as you can see here, we have an optimization uh, problem, but the objective function, which, which is the growth rate mu here, is not uh, 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 explicitly defined as a function of the all variables, which is not ideal for any kind of study. Um, so the study of this kind of models have two basically different kind of approaches. One is numerical, 
and that's the most common one, which is, for example, done in linear methods, in FBA, for example. And then the reason that is done in linear in uh, sorry models is because, of course, linear optimization is something very uh, uh, easy to be solved, even for thousands of reactions. There are very efficient algorithms for that. So in this kind of approach, uh, the problem is defined in this way. We have uh, for given environmental condition, which is um, would be the external concentrations with in which the cell is growing, and given parameters, uh, in this case of a nonlinear problem, also the uh, uh, particularly the, the, the kinetic parameters of the, the kinetic rate laws, and you want to op estimate the optimal state of the cell maximized growth. But there's a big problem here, which is, uh, in general, this kind of problem is non-convex, which means it is not tractable at genome scale. So at thousands of reactions, that's not uh, computationally uh, feasible to test all possible solutions by just brute force. So what I have been done, and we have some uh, uh, study published on this topic already, is instead kind of look at the problem somehow in the opposite direction, which is using analytical methods. And instead of looking uh, for the optimal uh, state of cells, we consider, we ask a different question, which is, okay, given the environmental conditions, the parameters again, and a particular cell state, which could be, for example, a measured uh, concentrations in vivo, we want to ask, okay, is this uh, cell state optimal in some sense, or in the sense that you just define? And what's about what about the economy uh, involved in this state? In other words, what the costs and benefits of each of the components? And also very importantly, uh, as was just discussed also, how this state can be controlled, right? So how we can increase um, the fitness that we assume here is just the growth rate, for example, for fast growing bacteria, or you want to decrease growth rate, which of course would be important in other scenarios also. So, and by doing that, uh, what we can get also, uh, not just one solution from one problem, but we get analytical equations that we can interpret them as fundamental quantitative principles, because we are based then on very fundamental assumptions and they are valid at all scales, right? They're not, uh, they're not um, restrict to a particular model, up to a model, they can be studied by themselves. And we have published that already uh, uh, two years ago. So, so, sorry, just going back, but there's essentially at least two main uh, limitations with this kind of approach. One is that what I mentioned, that we still depend on all kinetic parameters. And that's unfortunately uh, very uh, well known. Uh, uh, for example, for E. coli, I believe the KCAT, which is uh, one important parameter, is now only for 10% of the reactions, I believe. So that's a big problem, even trying to validate any type of solution uh, here. Another one is that this solution assumes a very particular scenario that we need to know uh, all the reactions which are active for some technical reasons uh, that we can discuss also later. Um, but because of these limitations, we also approach a uh, the problem in a different way. Uh, we get these equations, but we would like to ask, okay, can we get even simpler kind of uh, principles uh, or can you formulate this even simpler problem that we can solve and uh, in a way be less detailed, but more powerful in the sense that you can uh, apply that in a, in a larger scenario. And then we can define this another type of problem, which can be seen as a simplified version of the previous problem or the previous optimization I just mentioned. And the problem is, uh, basically what we had before, but instead of concern this, all this, let's say local mass uh, conservations for each uh, component uh, in the network, we can ask, okay, what's the global mass conservation? In, in other words, instead of considering uh, the, the flux balance, the mass balance, you consider, okay, what's the flux balance of all mass going into the cell or all mass going out of the cell? which corresponded to summing all rows of this uh, previous equation that we showed before. And on the left-hand side, we get this equation. On the right-hand side, we get the sum of all uh, mass concentrations, which is the density of the cell. And now we assume, okay, we don't actually, let's ignore that also. It's also not fixed. 
uh, we again consider the reaction kinetics and assume the cell density is given by the sum of proteins and metabolites. So the point, the first point is that uh, to notice that uh, for any given distribution of fluxes, we can find uh, a unique choice of protein concentrations and metabolites that maximize the growth rate. And we can note that just by first uh, uh, inspecting that uh, for fixed fluxes, this left-hand side here is, of course, a fixed value. This uh, second one is also a fixed value. And then we have growth rate and cell density, right? And cell density is a function now of the protein and metabolites. And minimizing, uh, for a given uh, distribution of fluxes, minim choosing these concentrations that minimize growth is the same one as maximize growth rate, right? Another way to see that is that just define growth rate as this divided by rho. So we are doing the same thing. So what we have now is a function here only on metabolites and protein concentrations, and the constraint is the kinetic constraint. Here defined in tau, so that is the inverse of the kinetic rate law. But we can see here also that each protein concentration is uniquely defined uh, by this equation. And that's something that has been done many times in many different studies before. So what we have here actually is a, a function on metabolite concentration. So the fluxes are fixed. These uh, functions are known and it depends only on metabolite concentrations now, which means that we have a very, the simplest kind of nonlinear optimization, which is just one function without constraints, right? So to find the necessary uh, conditions or the stability conditions, we just need to calculate the partial derivatives according to each metabolite concentration. And actually the, the derivative is, is also very straightforward because these are fixed. And then what we have, we have the partial derivative of this function style that we know this is just the inverse of the rate laws. And we have here one which corresponds to the derivative according to respective metabolite concentration. So we have an analytic equ equation here that's very general for any kind of uh, reaction rate law. And that's the combination that minimizes uh, the cell dry uh, density and maximize growth rate under the assumption that we don't consider the, the, the local mass conservation, right? So we just take this derivative straightforward and substitute uh, in the previous equation. Uh, and in the simplest case, just to give an idea that we have only one reaction using the substrate, the metabolite as a substrate. Uh, then we have three main relationships between the flux, the, percent, the concentration of protein, the concentration of metabolites. So uh, fluxes, the flux is scaled quadratically with the metabolite concentration and involves the two uh, kinetic parameters. And just substituting the Michaels meta here, we find something a little bit surprising that at optimality, whatever it is, uh, we predict that uh, the protein concentration relates to the metabolite concentration that the substrate of this reaction uh, in this, uh, with this simple equation here that's quadratic and depends only on the KM of this reaction, the corresponding reaction. It doesn't depend on the KCAT, which is, as I said, a huge advantage to actually try to validate this equation in practice because we don't have uh, many of these values of KCAT. And also we get, again, substituting an equation that relates the protein concentration with the respective uh, reaction rate of flux. And we have a linear term and a quadratic term here, a square root term that's also uh, important later today. Uh, so we have this kind of optimal relationship, relationships between these variables. So we don't predict what's the optimal uh, state, but we predict what's the optimal relationship between these variables at the optimal level. Um, so, if you consider the general case of irreversible Michelis momentum with many substrates, we do the same kind of derivation. We have uh, essentially the same equation as before, but we have summation for all proteins that are consumed each of uh, the metabolites in the metabolic network. And, but it's still a little bit difficult to validate this equation because we have many KMs here and we have a high order polynomial here actually to solve. So what we did was, okay, in many cases we have one summit here that is much higher than the other summons. In other words, we can approximate this summation by just uh, consider one of these terms. When the one protein is more than 50% of the mass of all proteins. So this P here is more than 50% for the other one. So we can approximate this equation 
basically pretending there's no other uh, protein uh, using these subs these metalloids as a substrate, so we get the same equation as before for uh, in the simplest case. Hey, uh, Hugo, you have uh, about five more minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I get uh, a little bit quick now. Uh, we actually uh, test this prediction, and then we we just published uh, last year. So what we did, we we, we uh, test this. Uh, optimally conditioned on E. coli data. And what we see here is a predict metabolite concentration, log scale, uh, in molar concentrations, and the measurable one in E. coli. So we predict the, this metabolite concentration based on the protein concentration that's dominant for this metabolite. And you can see that all predictions are, most predictions, almost all of them are in this range between three, four difference between uh, the actual measured. Uh, value, which is, uh, which says that on average, it seems that E. coli is approximating at least this kind of optimality. We, uh, later then, we now we test that also this relationship between metabolite concentrations with the flux. So if you assume that flux scales linearly with growth rate, uh, then this relationship would be, um, the way metabolite concentrations change with growth rate would be uh, on an exponent of 0 0.5, right? And then we test that. And it seems that on average, it also supports this idea that we have here the distribution of this exponent in E. coli and the measure or the median of these uh, measure values are very close to the prediction. And to finish, we tested uh, the relation between protein concentration and flux that we estimate. And then we relate to this to the important concept of growth laws that were introduced in 2010 by the group of Terry Wa. And growth laws, uh, uh, very quickly here, because uh, I'm running out of time, sorry. Uh, the fraction, phi here is the fraction of protein mass per total protein. So for the ribosome, they observed in 2010 that not only this observation that uh, dates many decades already, that the fraction of protein, pro, uh, sorry, ribosomal protein in total protein scales linearly with growth rate with uh, what they call the offset here, which would be the fraction at zero growth, uh, offset different than zero, which is kind of surprising. But they also show that this uh, also happens in the orthogonal case of antibiotics. So this also applies to sectors of protein. I'm not going to detail here, but what you show now that this optimality between enzyme and substrates uh, explain from first principles why you expect this kind of growth force. And uh, starting in with this optimality that we consider between protein concentration, mass protein concentration, and mass flux that we got before, noting that the first term corresponds exactly to the bound protein, and the second to the free protein, if you consider Michel semantic kinetics again. And if you just assume that the flux is scale again linearly with growth rate with a constant factor beta here, and that assumption is very uh, straightforward for, for some of reactions, for example, the ribosome itself, we know that the mass rate that uh, of the ribosome reaction uh, has to be equal to the, the rate of dilution of the total protein. So for the ribosome beta is exactly the total protein concentration here, and that's just mass conservation. And then we have a prediction for the protein concentration at different growth rates. So, uh, I just just go very quickly here. So the idea is that we have this nonlinear equation, but we have this linear term and we have a quadrat uh, or square root term. And the idea is that uh, if you take the linear expansion of this function around some reference points, and I'm, I'm not going to the calculation details because they are not essential right now, but we actually can estimate what would be the offset that we see, right? So. This equation looks linear when uh, the growth rate is high. And the, the hypothesis, the way, uh, the reason is that it's just uh, apparent uh, thing. And because cells tend to be approximating this optimality that we talked before. So we can add that we have a quantitative estimation for this offset and also for the, the slope of the, the growth law, which not surprisingly tends to be one over KCAT if you analyze here. And the offset of, we can see that we estimate the offset is, actually there is no offset, the offset is zero, when the KM is very small compared to the other values. And here's just, I mentioned before, here's just a, a, a quick picture to, 
to, to illustrate that. So we have the red is our prediction of optimality and the dashed line would be the regression around some reference point that's higher at saturation. So just to finish now, we test that with actual uh, data. So again, we have this relationship. For the ribosome, we have this mass conservation I mentioned before. And for MET E, uh, which is the last step in methionine biosynthesis pathway, we can also estimate 3% uh, is the fraction of methionine proteins. Um, so just to finish for the ribosome, the red line is our prediction. And you see that's very close to the actual data in Nikolai, that's the gray dots. And the dashed line is the regression that I mentioned before. The regression is very close to the actual offset that you get if you actually get the linear regression here. And for MET E, our prediction, which is red, is very close to the red line here that you cannot see because they are very close, but there's no offset. And the reason that MET, MET E, is, which is the highest uh, concentration enzyme in E. coli, which is almost compared to the ribosome itself, the KM is extremely low. So we can also explain that. Okay, so just to finish the conclusions uh, of this is that uh, with some just some few considerations, we can estimate some very simple uh, relationship, relationship between enzyme or, or in general protein, we call that can be also the, the ribosome and substrate in vivo. And this relationship explains at least on average, well, the, these concentrations in E. coli and also can explain the origins for the growth law. So I'd like to just acknowledge and thank you, Martin Lesch, for my group, and Terry Wa and Matteo Morios. Thank you very much.